Welcome to our conversation series with Hayden White, Professor Emeritus at UC Santa Cruz and Stanford University. We're going to be discussing his most recent book, The Practical Past, which came out with Northwestern University Press recently. I'm Ethan Kleinberg. I'm executive editor of History and Theory and professor of History and Letters at Wesleyan University. So Hayden, I thought I'd start um, by asking you for a quick overview of what you take the practical past to be and how this idea concept differs from what we think of as traditional disciplinary history. Yeah, I uh, borrowed this concept of the practical past from uh, uh, the conservative uh, British philosopher uh, Oakeshott. And uh, what I wanted to use it for was to make a distinction between that part of the past that historians feel competent to study and the rest of the past. Because, as you all know, uh, uh, people, historians speak of prehistorical phenomena, uh, ahistorical phenomena, things that might look like historical phenomena but really aren't, because they don't lend themselves to study by the techniques and the methodologies that uh, uh, historians uh, practice. In one sense, uh, what counts as uh, an historical entity uh, is determined by whether it can be studied by historical methods. Mm -hmm. If it can't, then you just leave it aside. And it's the relationship between the excluded from history and what is included in it uh, that I'm trying to examine. Yeah, so, so in, you have been a, a critic of traditional historians and historiography for some time, but I think it's important for us to distinguish the positions that you held in some of your most famous works like Meta History or in later works uh, because people don't stay in the same place as they were and clearly you've been thinking about these issues and you've moved, uh, evolved, changed I would assume. And so I, I'm curious about what you see as the relation between the practical past and Meta History which also has just come out in a uh, a, a revised edition or an up, uh, just a new edition. Uh, and how perhaps to your mind you see this as reflecting the ways that the theory or philosophy, is, philosophy of history has changed uh, over the past 40 years? Well, here the, it's important to grasp what's involved in the notion of the practical. Uh, and of course by practical I mean in a philosophical sense what Kant meant by it, namely uh, uh, action uh, rather than uh, uh, a theoretical way of uh, contemplating the past. We want to, for, for many centuries, history was regarded as a practical discipline. Uh, but when it decided to become scientific, uh, when historians decided to become scientists, or to shift over from a belletristic idea of what historical writing was to a scientific notion, modern scientific notion of uh, investigation and research. Uh, they, they had to, in order to gain some kind of acceptable acceptance by other scientists, they had to eschew uh, uh, any claim to having practical relevance. So this and, would be history for history's sake. Yeah, that is, well, uh, all of the, dis uh, all sciences uh, admit to having a theoretical and a practical or applied uh, dimension. You have applied mathematics mm -hmm. as against theoretical math mathematics. You have theoretical physics versus practical or technologically applied physics. Uh, and these are two different operations. Uh, hist history used to be practical in the sense that it belonged to uh, moral philosophy. Uh, moral philosophy is about how do, you, how do you act in such a way as to realize uh, ethical goals or interests. Uh, but uh, when you become or aspire to become scientific, you have to give up that kind of thing. I believe that in principle, in becoming scientific, historians ought to have or committed to 
a non-evaluative way of thinking about the data they're dealing with. So one of the things that's interesting about that is, is you're clearly known as a theorist of history. And as I'm hearing it, you're ad advocating in a way a, a return to a practical or a practice-based understanding of history, the, the practical being uh, almost didactic and being allowing us to, to understand morals or some sorts of lessons that can be learned from the past. Uh, and the claim is in the, in the imminently sort of, historians think of themselves as practical today. They think of themselves as not theoretical at all, but I, I suppose where, where you're taking this is the, they simply disallow the theory that allows them to claim their neutral practice. Well, the reason they want to claim neutrality is that uh, modern historical writing and research uh, was set up as an antidote to ideology so that uh, an ideological, a complex ideological position like that of Marx uh, has to undergo a test by, by historians as to whether uh, what is asserted there uh, conforms in some way to what we know scientifically about history. So uh, it was once thought that over here you have ideologies that make predictions about the future, uh, suggest uh, courses of action, political programs. And over here you have the historians uh, finding out the truth about the society for which you're making these recommendations. And they're the ones that you have to pass the test with. Uh, my argument is that uh, most people, non-professional historians, get their history from something more like novels and uh, journalism and uh, maybe even ethnography uh, uh, rather than from history. Because technically speaking, a historian has no interest in any given individual unless they're a part of the elite group of agents that are supposed to make history. No, as historians, they have no interest in you. They have no interest in anybody in this room as individuals. Only if they blunder into or become a victim of some event, such as 9-11, uh, would a historian have any interest in them at all. So uh, history is not, insofar as you would want to use the past, your knowledge of the past, to construct an identity. You can't go to the historians and say, help me construct an identity. Right, right. What do you do? You, you depend upon memory, which historians say is always fallible and has to be worked over if you're going to use it. Or tradition. <laughs> or tradition or something like that. Oral traditions, yeah. What your mother or your family photographs tell you about yourself. And this is the domain that I think uh, one might think of as that of the part of the practical past that has some relevance for individuals trying to use the past as including themselves. Do you think it's problematic to think of them as past in a way that it brackets the, the, the ethical issues, uh, the issues of, certainly in cases of, of things we think of as strong evil, by considering them past, it allows us to obfuscate or ignore the problems of evil in the present. This is what uh, Berber Bevernage has referred to as a kind of temporal Manichaeism, where whatever is evil is past, and we're able to use our position in the present to look back on it, but it allows us to avoid confronting precisely these ethical issues going forward into the future. I think that uh, Bevernage is onto something there as far as um, to historicize anything, event, person, process, uh, is to domesticate it. Uh, it's, it's to classify it. Uh, and it is to locate it uh, in a place other than whatever you consider the present to be. You distance it. Uh, as uh, um, is it Mark Saber, is mm -hmm. the one who uh, writes about historical distance. Uh, you distance things uh, when you treat them 
historiographically, and even anything in the present, if you're a historian, you are aware of its fading at the moment you, you grasp it, at the moment you come upon it, it, it begins to fade. If it's in your visual field, your living visual field, you come upon some, some event in the past, you have to try to determine when it began and when it's effectively over, by which I mean it ceases to have effect. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, this issue of uh, uh, what happens, uh, Friedlander, Saul Friedlander raises that in his book on the extermination of the Jews uh, by the Nazis. Uh, he says uh, ordinary historical work would domesticate this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I take it this is the point um, being alluded to by Bevernage. You distance evil. Uh, you try to hang on to good, uh, but as we know, good and evil are relative terms. Yes. Well. Unless you believe in an absolute, absolute. evil. Absolutely, right. So let me uh, change gears a little bit to ask a question that came from, from Winston James, uh, professor of history at UC Irvine. And this is a question that came up at a recent conference in Irvine where we were discussing your book. Um, and he asks, I'm puzzled as to what a concrete historical study following all of your theoretical protocols would look like. He wonders whether such a model already exists. And why resort to what you call ideal typifications, clearly drawing on Weber, rather than relying on concrete examples to make this argument? Additionally, I'd be curious to know which historian writing today claims that historian is a science, who, who he wants names, although I don't know that's necessary, practices what's called historiology or pastology. Uh, but maybe we could start by defining historiology and pastology. Well, uh, <clears throat> he, he uses the term, he th suggests that I uh, use these terms disparagingly. I don't. Uh, uh, historiology is a term that uh, Heidegger tried to popularize uh, on the analogy of theology, uh, geology, and so forth. Uh, which would point to the epistemological uh, foundations of a specifically historical way of looking at reality. Uh, so that you, you could get away from the ambiguity that comes by the use of the word history to name a certain set of phenomena on the one hand and the books written about those phenomena on the other. Is this a history? Yes, it's a history book. Is this history? Yes, this really happened in the past. So uh, historiology would be a way of distinguishing between uh, uh, a, uh, a rigorous or systematic study of the past. The logos suggests that. Uh, and you could uh, even start playing around with ideas of historiosophy for those uh, uh, studies of the past intended to result in prophecy and uh, the drawing of moral uh, conclusions from them. Uh, this would uh, allow you to get a, uh, would allow you to grasp that history is presented to us in many different modes. Uh, some activist, some, uh, uh, some pacifist, uh, some, uh, some that are content to analyze and just try to discover laws of historical So, so for Heidegger, you could say that the flip side of the, the historiology that is this traditional discipline, disciplinary history would be the, the lived history, the Geschichtlichkeit, right? Our ontological condition as historical creatures for whom being is an issue. And of course, the makeup of our being for Heidegger is all historically conditioned in this way. Um, Andrew Baird was wondering whether the practical past and Michael Oakeshott, in a way, has an affinity to this Heideggerian understanding of our ontology as historical beings, our makeup being primarily historical, whether, whether Oakeshott serves the function in a way of that Heideggerian analysis from being in time. Well. Um my response to that is that in trying to distinguish between the past in general 
and that part of it that we can study by historical method. Uh, what you're saying is that, well, there are two different kinds of things out there in the past. Uh, one that can be treated historically or by historians comfortably, and others that can't, and such as dreams, uh, such as the history of delusions, uh, or a book like uh, Foucault's History of Madness, History of Sexuality, all these kinds of texts, is, uh, if one wants examples of uh, what I would regard as something that is more uh, pastological, I would use, uh, so the these might be the uh, uh, concrete examples uh, of yeah. this sort of uh, history yeah. uh, that allows for something like That's the practical right. and past. And on the analogy of historiology, I would say, why don't we gather disciplines together, only those disciplines together that are interested in the past in general, psychoanalysis, different aspects of the uh, astrology, archaeology, history, uh, certain kind of writing. So could this be, so you use the term pastology. I know Michael Roth has often imagined a field that would be called historical studies, yeah. where it was no longer the domain uh, solely of historians, but would allow for these other, for others, uh, uh, disciplines, scholars, theorists who are interested in questions of the past right. to be able to come together right. in a more interdisciplinary engagement. Right. Would that also fall under the umbrella of your practical past? That's what uh, uh, historical studies, no, I would call them past studies. Past studies. Studies of the past have always specified that certain t subjects are amenable to historiological inquiry and others are not. For example, the old Stone Age there is now a guy in Harvard uh, who's thinking of trying to include... So Dan Smale. Smale, yes. yes. Is trying to include the Old Stone Age, the New Stone Age, and the Mesolithic and so forth in the array of, uh, in a panorama, which he wants to call history. Uh, I would see this as, in my terms, it would be an attempt to uh, fuse or meld that part of the past that is non-historical with that part of the past that is. And the mechanism he uses to do so is a, a scientific mechanism, uh, well, specifically it, it neuroscience. Meta, it had to be meta-historical. Meta-historical. Uh, in other words, uh, if, if you were trying to affect their union on philosophical grounds, then you would have to rethink a theory that would uh, allow for the fusion of the insights into the past that come in novels, modern novels, with the insights into the past that historians provide, right. and not see them as opposed. Right, but on the on the the model of on the neuroscientific model, it's really looking at what MRIs of brain functioning in the present can tell us in order to conjecture how the brain well, functioned uh, in the yeah, past. Well, I mean, it's, those uh, actually, as a matter of fact, in my ideal department of uh, past studies, uh, you, you would have genetics. I mean, genetics would have to be there mm -hmm. because genetics is a particular way of studying the human past that goes far beyond what historians are willing yes. uh, to. Archaeology as well. Is a... Exactly, exactly. So, so following the line of thought of this ideal department of pastological studies, or whatever we choose to call it. I have a question from uh, Jesse Torgerson, who is an assistant professor of letters at Wesleyan University, and it's on the question of pedagogy. Um, he writes, uh, I read the collection of essays as an argument of definition and distinction in order to effect separation and liberation, to free the practical past, which can take up the challenge to act, this is quoting you, if only from time to time and only relatively effectively, end quote. From history, to chisel away at the authority over the entire past claimed by history's professional guardians. That would be the, the people who normally teach in the history yeah. departments. His question, how do we then teach? How do we apply this distinction to the professional discipline's pedagogical monopoly over the past? Unless we can actually free the practical past from the practices and authoritative <laughs> claims of the historical or historiological past in the classroom, 
won't the present state of affairs proceed untraumatized? But perhaps a small revolution first. When, at what stage and in what setting, do we teach students that events happen, facts are established? Yeah. Well, uh, I, the pedagogical question in our context, the American university context, uh, requires that you distinguish between teaching history to graduate students whose aim are to become uh, professional historians and what you want to affect it by teaching history to young people who's not, who are not headed towards a career as a professional historian or a... So it would be principally undergraduate teaching then Okay, on then your undergraduate model. teaching uh, would require... Uh, this is where I think pastology mm -hmm. uh, is more relevant than historiology. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, because pastology right now, in my preference, uh, would be heavily dependent upon psychoanalysis. Um, because uh, that, those aspects of the past that young people are interested in are their own past, and that means their own personal past. And uh, you, you might seek analogies between the way we uh, relate to our past in order to construct an identity or, if nothing else, to solve a problem. I reach into, the, into my memory to find what it means to do long division. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's not in my consciousness most of the time. I think back and do it. And uh, uh, beyond, beyond that, I would, I would want to raise the question of uh, uh, psychoanalysis, not is the psychoanalysis of past agents, because I don't think you can psychoanalyze anyone who's dead. Though Freud seemed to think you could. Uh, well, he, th he thought you could uh, raise psychoanalytically relevant questions, but you're not treating no. uh, uh, Moses. Uh, you're you're uh, raising questions about uh, what has been said about him and his actions. Uh, but uh, leaving that apart, if, if you think you can psychoanalyze the dead, all the better. <laughs> I mean, from, from the standpoint of students. Uh, undergraduate students who are, who are worried about what it means to be a person, what it means to be a responsible person. So, so what might you have them read in this course, do you think? Well, I'd have them read Freud. Freud, clearly. <laughs> uh, because I think that uh, the interpretation of dreams is a kind of paradigmatic text for talking about uh, 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 accounts of the world that are uh, paralogical that are not, uh, uh, he calls them rebus, mm -hmm. the rebus effect. Uh, how you read um, what would be text once they're reported, how you read them as, uh, uh, for, as symptomatic rather than as uh, communicative. And uh, how you, this uh, allows you to teach uh, uh, young people about repression uh, repression of their own uh, memories, uh, distortions, d displacements, and so forth. So uh, you begin to al allow them to see the place that the imagination can have in the reconstitution of a past different from the one mm -hmm. that formal thought and uh, inquiry into the archive would give them. If they go to the archive, they're not going to find out very much about their own past. So let me ask one last question for this uh, uh, session, although it's one I think we all know the answer to. to. To your mind then, assuming this sort of undergraduate pastological studies, do you think this then would have an impact, effect, change on the way those students coming out of the undergraduate work into graduate studies in history would operate or think? Well, I think the question here, uh, is formulated by whom? What's his name? Uh, uh, by Jesse, Jesse yeah. Torgerson. Uh, this question, like so many questions get put to me, is how can we save history? Mm -hmm. You see, well, maybe we don't want to save it in its present form. Right. I mean, it, if it's losing in popularity, students aren't going to it, 
as, as they did at an earlier time. Maybe it calls for the transformation of the, or the uh, expansion uh, of that field of studies called history, the kind of change in it that designated it as the past, as one way of studying the past, but not the only way. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we'll, we'll take up in our, our next session, because one of the, the key questions is about this relation to what's happening in the discipline of history and what it means if you want to reinvigorate or rethink it, whether that means simply going back to save what's already there or trying to import precise, precisely the sorts of issues, questions, themes, and feels, <laughs> visual studies, for instance, into a study of history that, it, that, that is more theoretical and more self-reflexive in an attempt to transform it. And so maybe saves the wrong word. Maybe we were talking about metamorphosis earlier. Maybe it's about the transformation of what uh, the field of history could be going forward, which wouldn't be well, the same I, as what I it was. Not, I have not proposed changes. I'm suggesting possibilities. Mm -hmm. But it certainly is uh, well argued in your book. And so we'll, we'll hit that when okay. we come to the next, uh, next section. So th okay. thank you so much for this one. And I hope uh, those who are interested will tune in and see the next one. Mm -hmm.